Buenos días a todos. Vamos a empezar ya la jornada. Muchas gracias por estar aquí una vez más, por acudir a, a una nueva convocatoria eh, en Medialab Prado, a quien tenemos que agradecer siempre su colaboración y su participación para, para poder seguir eh, la reflexión en torno a las bibliotecas como espacios de creación. Gracias al Foro Cultural de Burgos, porque gracias a él y a, y a Media Lab Prado podemos contar hoy con David Weinberger, que nos hablará de su experiencia eh, en la Universidad de Harvard. También muchas gracias a las dos experiencias que forman parte del programa, la Biblioteca Luis Rosales de la Comunidad de Madrid y la Biblioteca Montserrat Abelló de Bibliotecas de Barcelona, y a Lidia Teira y todos los ponentes que van a estar en la mesa que, de debate que, que va a coordinar. Gracias a todos, porque lo que queremos de hoy es eh, continuar con un espacio de reflexión en torno a las posibilidades que las bibliotecas tienen como plataformas de intercambio de conocimiento y de producción de conocimiento. Y creemos que ese ecosistema de las bibliotecas eh, permite la convivencia entre personas y organizaciones que acumulan conocimientos y saberes y experiencias diversas y que todo esto junto puede ser eh, fantástico para, para promover la creación de comunidad, los objetivos de cohesión social, de intercambio y de formación a lo largo de toda la vida. Así que contamos con todos vosotros para que esta mañana sigamos avanzando en la reflexión de, de creación de, de todos estos espacios en las bibliotecas, como parte de, de su futuro y en algunos casos ya es presente. Doy la palabra a Marcos García, director de Medialab Prado, con el que hemos trabajado para que hoy podamos estar todos aquí. Gracias. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Concha, y muchas gracias a todos por haber venido hoy a, a esta jornada eh, que hemos titulado eh, Las bibliotecas como laboratorios ciudadanos. Es como una segunda parte de otra jornada que hubo hace algo más de un año en, aquí en Medialab Prado, eh, también una propuesta de de la Subdirección General de Bibliotecas, con colaboración con la Embajada, y ahí estuvimos viendo las posibilidades también de, de las nuevas tecnologías de Internet como, como, como herramientas para repensar eh, los nuevos modelos de institución cultural y de las bibliotecas. En aquel momento nos centramos en, en los espacios maker, y en esta ocasión, eh, aprovechando que estaba aquí David Weinberger, eh, pensábamos que era eh, una buena idea eh, seguir eh, con esta conversación y en este caso veremos que las, las implicaciones de la irrupción de Internet y de las redes digitales a veces tienen eh, implicaciones que a lo mejor no son tan directas como la incorporación de nuevas, nuevas herramientas o, o, o cambiar del, pasar del, del papel a, a la tablet, sino también para la oportunidad para repensar los modelos. Y como decía Concha, pensar que las bibliotecas pueden ser lugares, y lo son de hecho, de producción de conocimiento, de relación, de producción de comunidad. Y de hecho, eh, siempre nos, nos ha gustado mucho mantener eh, conversaciones eh, con, con bibliotecarios y con experiencias en bibliotecas, porque creo que de las bibliotecas podemos aprender mucho sobre cuáles pueden ser las instituciones culturales del futuro. Eh, en nuestro caso, es una, un centro cultural del Ayuntamiento de Madrid, que describimos, denominamos también eh, Laboratorio Ciudadano, eh, Aquí no hay, una, no hay una colección, no es un museo, eh, y hemos podido ensayar unos formatos de, de actividad que lo que hacen es tratar de facilitar la conexión entre personas para la producción de proyectos, de proyectos culturales. Personas que vienen de, perfil, de mundos distintos, tienen perfiles diferentes y tienen en común un proyecto que alguien ha propuesto y luego el resto de las personas que forman parte del equipo de trabajo se han sumado de manera voluntaria para llevarlo a cabo, ¿no? Hay algunas personas que han descrito Media Lab como eh, Internet en el espacio físico, como incubadora de comunidades, y es una descripción que nos, que nos gusta mucho, porque si os fijáis, no he hablado mucho de, de tecnologías a la hora de, 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 de describir eh, cómo funciona Media Lab, pero lo cierto es que la red permite eh, formas de convocatoria abiertas que antes eran imposibles y sobre todo permiten y aquí es donde creo que eh, los bibliotecarios tienen mucho que aportar, eh, permiten formas de, de, de documentación de los proyectos para que lo que se hace a nivel local luego pueda tener efecto en otros lugares. 
Entonces yo os invitaría luego en el descanso a pasaros por el edificio de al lado, que justo hay ahora un, una actividad de, bastante viva de, de un, un laboratorio donde hay 10 proyectos que se están desarrollando. En este caso el tema es eh, inteligencia colectiva para la democracia y han venido personas de todo el mundo para desarrollar prototipos pues para mejorar eh, formas de deliberación, tomas de decisiones, eh, presupuestos participativos, eh, pero lo hacen presencialmente. ¿no? Y ese, esa, esa idea de, del centro cultural o de la biblioteca como espacio de, de socialización nos parece fundamental en la era de, de Internet y de las redes digitales. Eh, bueno, sin más voy a pasar a, ya a presentar a, a David Weinberger, que es alguien que yo creo que ha influido mucho en muchos contextos diferentes, pero creo que también en, en, el, de, en el de las bibliotecas. Eh, creo que es una de las personas que mejor ha ido analizando las consecuencias de, de la erupción de, de Internet y de las redes digitales, incluso también eh, haciendo un análisis crítico sobre las predicciones, quizá eh, eh, muy optimistas, de aquel manifiesto Clue Train, eh, revisando una y otra vez cómo la, 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 la web, Internet, eh, no se ha convertido en ese lugar que todos esperábamos que fuera. ¿no? Entonces, pero todavía, con, bueno, a pesar de ese análisis crítico, también viendo el potencial eh, de las transformaciones que puede provocar, ¿no? directa e indirectamente, también en las organizaciones, en las formas de gobierno, etc. Eh, mencionaría sus dos últimos libros eh, de hace... Más de 10 años, Everything is Misceláneo, todo es misceláneo, el nuevo poder del desorden digital, donde yo diría que prácticamente podría estar dedicado a, a, a los bibliotecarios, y luego uno más reciente que es Too Big to Know, eh, como demasiado grande para, para ser conocido. Eh, es un, el subtítulo es largo: Cuando los hechos no son los hechos y la persona más inteligente en la sala es la propia sala. Algo así era el. Perdón si no recuerdo bien el título. Eh, y curiosamente estos libros no han sido traducidos a, a, al, al español y creo que es una pena, pero todavía estamos a tiempo. Entonces, eh, nada, sin más, eh, le invito a David a hacer la presentación, luego eh, tendremos un, un pequeño debate y pasaremos a ver las, las dos experiencias eh, que comentaba Concha. Muchas gracias y welcome David. Thank you. I don't remember the subtitle either, so that's fine. It's, it's very long. Thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I, I love the idea of libraries as a citizen lab, a laboratory. I think that's, that's a really, there are many wonderful ways of framing libraries. They're very, obviously, very rich institutions. That, that's, that's a really provocative and helpful one. Um, so I'm, I want to, I'm going to give you um, an expansive definition And pardon my, I speak English. I, I had uh, Spanish all through um, lower levels of school, high, through high school, but I'm not very good at languages, and America is horrible at teaching languages, and so I'm speaking to you in English, and thank you for translating um, so well. Ah, so I want to give an expansive definition of platform. Um, then I'm going to look at what I think that definition means, what it brings with it. Um, then I want to look as quickly as I can at two technical, technical implementations um, of this, and then briefly, very briefly, um, talk about one way forward. And I can tell you that Spain in this regard is more advanced than America, so I should not be the one speaking on this, but I, I'll, I will very briefly. Um, so when the Guardian, wonderful, important, newspaper re reviewed a new translation of Don Quixote. Um, it had to figure out where to link the book to, what online link it would give. And it, it did the thing that many, many uh, places will do, which is, in this case, here's the link, and it takes you to their bookstore. Perfectly reasonable, especially if you are the guardian and you're trying to uh, make a little money, nothing wrong with that. Um, But the issue is, if at least in English, if you're talking about a book, let's say, and you want to put in a link to it, which is the thing that people on the web do, it's how we build the web, it's the natural thing on the web, there's no place to link to. 
So you link to Amazon. It's not that great a place to link to. Or maybe Wikipedia, if it has a, Don Quixote, of course, has a Wikipedia page. Most books don't. So there's a hole in the internet. If you want to know about or provide a link to just about anything in culture, there's a place on the web to do it, at least one place. For books, at least in English, there isn't. You don't know where to link to. This is a hole in the internet. And as they say, and I think there's actually great truth to this, if it's not on the web, it doesn't exist. People can't find it. There's no way of maintaining that thing in the conversation that is the internet. This is, this is a, a great danger. This is, I think, a tremendous danger to our culture, which has been based upon books, but not just books. Um, and I think the question, one of the many questions we need to be asking as, as um, uh, people who care about culture is, how do we get, how do, how do we maintain book, book culture? How do we enable it to spread? And when I say book culture, I really mean library culture, not just, obviously not just books but the parts of our culture that we have entrusted to libraries, which is a very significant part, how do we get that, not just preserve it by putting it on the web in a way that it can be found and used, but how do we make it pervasive throughout? Books are not, and other such objects, are not the first thing that people talk about on the web. It's just not. And one of the reasons is there's no good ways of, of linking. So uh, I, one of the ways of doing this is uh, treating libraries as platforms. And when I say platform, um, and that term has come to mean in many circles, it is, means the big uh, players. It means Facebook and Google and the rest of them. And that is absolutely not what I mean by platform. I hope that's clear from the beginning. I mean something different. What I mean by a platform is something that enables unpredictable uses of resources, of services, data, content, whatever. It's, that's the essence for me. It enables unpredicted uses, which means that platforms are a way of making more, enabling more to be made out of what we already have. And in that sense, libraries have always been platforms. That's exactly, uh, not exactly is too strong a word, but that is what you do as librarians. It's what libraries do. They enable us to make more of what our culture has developed. This, a platform strategy is actually, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, only because uh, you know, we have better things to talk about, but a platform strategy overall, I think, is an epical, historic change. And not just an historic, I think it's actually a prehistoric change in how we think about the future. So uh, the uh, um, spears, spear tips, 500,000 years old have been found. We've been making spear tips for five, for half a million years. The strategy we use then is the same as the strategy we use throughout our, our culture and history, which is, it's a basic strategy. It's that you anticipate the future, what the needs are going, to, what your needs are going to be, and then you prepare for it. You anticipate you're going to need a spear to hunt, so you make a spear. That is the fundamental way that strategy has worked. A platform strategy says, you know, that, sure, we're going we're gonna to do a lot of that, that sort of old um, strategy. But a platform strategy says we can, we can now do better in many instances by not anticipating what will happen, by enabling people other than us to make more of what we have. We cannot anticipate every use that people are going to make of our resources. So let's let them make more of it. So I want to talk about four different ways in which platforms make more. And one, of the, one of the things that platforms do and need is to make more access. So to keep library culture alive, we can no longer, and I think if you disagree, let me know. I don't think you will. We need to make this culture as accessible as possible. Libraries have always wanted to do that. You would be open more and more hours if you had the resources to do so. Uh, online, that means making things easy to find and easy to obtain, to read, to quote, to link to. 
And open, are, is everybody familiar? I, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure, I'm sure you do, but is everybody familiar with the open access movement? Um, by which authors and publishers make freely and openly available the work of authors and other creators. This is, from my point of view, this is so vitally important in order to keep library culture, which is to say culture, alive. Uh, Creative Commons, of course, is a way of licensing that enables this. Now there's a long conversation, which I am not gonna have right now, <laughs> but that I care about very deeply over intellectual property. A phrase, an English phrase, I hate with a passion. Intellectual work is not property. The concept does not make sense. It was, it's an attempt to lock content down and make money off of it, which is not the first thing a culture should care about. I know that Europe and America overall generally have a difference of opinion about what the moral root of copyright should be. I'm obviously generalizing terribly here, but in this side of the ocean, frequently copyright is taken as a right of authors, which I think is a terrible, terrible path forward. In America, one of the things that I think America has gotten pretty much right, um, which is you know not all that much perhaps, but in this case, uh, we at least think of copyright not as the right of an author, but as a culture's right. And I think that's, and, and we fail to live up to it, but that's, I think, for me, the better way of thinking about it. I throw that out as a provocation. I'm going to move on, unless somebody wants to yell at me. Okay, you can yell at me later. So more access, more knowledge. And I, I'm going to spend a little time on this, because the question is, what do we mean by knowledge? And I don't mean, oh, let's, get, let's fill up more books. That's a good thing to do, but I mean, I mean something in addition to that. So if it's 1923 and you've been interested in this young scientist, Albert Einstein, who has what seems like a really crazy, insane theory, but very interesting, and you know that there is a critical experiment, the next time there's a solar eclipse, there's going to be an experiment that will confirm or deny uh, the truth of Einstein's theory, and you're waiting, and the day comes, and the next day, in fact, it's written up on the front page of the New York Times, and obviously Einstein was right, and, but you're so excited about this, and you want to know more, you have questions or ideas, too bad. It's 1923. This is all you get. You get this rectangle of information, and you don't complain because it's 1923, and you're happy to get that information. Now, if that's all you got, and you were unable to go out on the web, this, there were no links in it, and it, you couldn't search for this information and find out more and ask questions, you would be so frustrated. You wouldn't know what went wrong. Why is this one piece of information on the internet dead? Why is it so closed? We now take for granted that this is not the case. But that's very new. That's hugely important and extremely beneficial. That is a world-changing fact that we all live in now, even as we complain about all the terrible things the internet does, this changes, this by itself changes everything. So let's say it's now 2011 and you are a scientist at the Large Hadron Collider and you come up, you, you generate data that suggests that neutrinos travel faster than light, which means Einstein is wrong and you can't, you don't believe it yet. You have the data, but you, you can't make sense of it. This is obviously true, what I'm telling you. And so the scientists involved could have gotten this published in any scientific journal, a hugely important uh, experiment, uh, but they didn't do that. They posted it as quickly as they could to archive.org, which is a, a site where any scientist can post anything she wants at any stage of development, no review, no peer review, just post it as it is. So they did this um, both to get, get it up there quickly, but primarily because they couldn't understand their own data. It was very puzzling, and they wanted they wanted help, so they posted it on the, on the web, and sure enough, very quickly, thousands of posts were made explaining it, talking about it, questioning it, explaining it to journalists, high school students who have questions, maybe for their homework, uh, people answering those questions, physicists arguing about it, uh, crazy people having cra posting crazy theories, all linked. You got a web, a very informal web of of information, of ideas. And if you wanted to know about the, this experiment, this data, this is where you went. You didn't just go to the original article. You may never even read the original article because it's in physics and you may not, you know, 
this is where you went. You went out on the web, you found what you found, you follow, it followed links, and perhaps you replied. This is where the knowledge lives, in this network, not in that single article. That's obviously a very important part of it, but the knowledge lives in the links in, uh, that bind together this informal network. This is where knowledge is, not in the article. This is a very important, and we take this for granted now, this is a very important change in how we think about knowledge, uh, in, my, in my belief. There's one of the ways of putting this is the part of this subtitle that you remembered, thank you, um, which is, we, in the old world, we are used to thinking that the smartest person in the room is the person at the front. And I can tell you, by the way, in this case, it's absolutely not the case. You f know far more about libraries than I do. In any case, we have thought the smartest person in the room is, is that person. And yeah, not, you know, maybe that used to be true, but it's no longer the case. Now the smartest person in the room is the room itself. It's the connections among all the people who are participating in the generation and questioning of knowledge. And this is an evolutionary leap forward for us because human individuals have very small brains. We humans have like a kilogram of brain and that's it and that's not enough to understand the world. We can only do this collaboratively and in cla uh, uh, collaborations that include in every case differences and disagreements. That's what knowledge looks like now. So how do libraries build smart rooms? Uh, there's no one answer to this. There may not be an answer to this. You all already do it one way or another because you are convening uh, people and ideas uh, in, in um, online and in real space. You are already doing this. This is one of the this is one of the wonderful things about libraries is public spaces. Um, but we can do more of it now because we have online resources. So in overall, the way to do it is just to connect, 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 connect connect everything, every person, every piece of data, every interest, every mistake, every review, every idea, every opinion that you can within your community and then across communities. That's what a smart room is. It's, and a connection means not just formal links, it means also moderating the forms of, uh, and shaping the form of conversation so that it's helpful. It serves everybody's own needs. Okay, the next, um, consequence or implication of a uh, platform as something that makes more, is that it makes more meaning. And this is part one, I'm gonna come back to a second part in a moment. So this, I, this is 100% familiar to you, but of course in physical space we have to, if we wanna organize things in physical space, it's the nature of matter that it has, things um, can only be in one place at a time. Everything has to be somewhere, but it can't be in two places, only one place at a time. That's just the way, you know, I know it sucks, it's just the way matter works, so we're stuck with it. And so we've had to come up with organizational schemes in which we do the best that we can, and we do very well, it's a highly refined skill, where we figure out, you know, if you have a book about the recipes of the ancient Sparta, Spartan army, lots of places it could go, and so you make the best decision that you can, which is the only, what you have to do. Um, now we, online, digitally, you don't have to make those decisions. You can let people, for example, many different ways of doing this, but you can let people tag things, apply their own labels to them. Um, we are very, this is now a very familiar thing on the internet. Gmail lets you do this very easily. The, in, in the US, the very important game platform, <coughs> Steam, where you can buy games and, and the like, um, lets you review them and also lets users tag them. And t users sometimes provide tags that the game makers may not like, like it's buggy, the game is full of bugs, but it's very, very useful. It can be in as many different categories, each of the tags is like a category or, or a shelf, it can be as many as you want. My friend Doc Searles has like 50,000 photos up on Flickr and he tags them extensively and some of the tags are quite obvious and, and helpful for people who are, might be interested in finding this sort of image. Some of them only make sense to Doc, I don't know what I don't know what some of these mean. I don't know, don't know what La, Laura Lahars means or whatever. Doesn't matter. Doc can put up, he's making it available and findable by the world, but also refindable by him because he has 50,000 photos up. That's a perfectly good use of tags. It doesn't make any sense. It may not be coherent with other people's, but so what? If you wanted to make this fully uh, if you wanted to provide a taxonomy of, of slide labels, you can, I guess, and there's gonna be some advantages to that, but it's also gonna be much narrower. The problem with order, with organizing things, is that order 
does not scale. And we are in a scaled world. It doesn't even scale for 50,000 photos by one obsessive photographer, my friend, much less across the billions of photos that are out on the web. Order doesn't scale, but fortunately, messiness, it scales great. Messiness, messiness can get as big as you want. That's wonderful because messiness also scales meaning. Every label that Doc applies or somebody else applies, even the crazy ones that make no sense, each of them provide a little more meaning to that object. And this is, again, something we have never seen in the world before. It's something that the internet provides. Simultaneous ordering without limit um, that builds, builds meaning across the environment. OK, um, next is um, libraries as platforms build more possibilities. And I'm going to get slightly technical here. I, I, uh, you'll let me know if I'm not making sense. Um, so this is about APIs or application programming interfaces. If this is familiar to you. Could you just sort of nod like this? OK, uh, th I'll, I'll spend just a, mo a moment or two on this. So you have, libraries have, a whole set of information of various sorts. This is a tiny little slice, just for example. I mean, you know about the content, of course, but you also have catalogs and you have holdings information, you have usage information, which is so important and is, so, and is not used, but I'll leave that alone for the moment, um, et cetera. You have lots and lots of information. An API is a technical layer, a piece of software that runs on, and, and you have systems that are managing these. You have computer systems managing all of these. An API is a technical layer, it's a piece of technology that runs on top of all of those other systems. And it's a translator. It knows how to talk to each of these applications um, that are managing these systems for you. It knows how to talk to them and make requests for information. It also knows how to talk externally to, uh, to applications that want to use this. And one of those applications, for example, will be your online. I will do this two more times, just to let you know. That's how long it takes me to learn not to bang into objects. Um, you uh, presumably all have, I'm sure you all have online catalogs, that's an application. And with an API, which your catalog may well be using, your online catalog may well be using, um, the user, the piece the user sees, the user app, speaks, when the, when the user makes a request, for example, to see uh, what the library knows about the Inferno, Dante's Inferno. The user presses the button or whatever in the application on her phone. That phone then speaks to the API in a language that the API understands. That is, the API understands, oh, somebody wants to know about the Inferno. The API also knows how to talk to the software managing your information. And so it says, oh, for that, we got to look at catalog and look at holdings or whatever. Those systems speak to the API. The API translates into computer talk that the application understands, and the user now gets the information. Okay, so that's the basic architecture. And I'll tell you why it's important in a second, but it sits between the applications and the back end systems, the computer systems that um, your library is using. There are a couple reasons why this is important. One is that it's simply a good architecture for, for um, building systems uh, because you may change your holdings. Let's say you decide your holdings database, it's just out of date. You want to get something newer for whatever reason. There it is. Um, and so you swap in a new one. Without an API, you have an, you have an application that's talking, that needs information from the holdings um, catalog. You've got to change the application. You've got to teach it how to talk to it. With an API, nothing changes. Because when you install it, you tell the API how to talk to the holdings um, database, and then the, the applications can just continue talking to the API, and the API will do the translation. You can swap these things in and out without having to change anything above the API, which can be lots and lots of different applications. So this, is, this makes systems way more resilient, and it's a, good, uh, it's, a, it's a good architecture just for that reason. But there's another reason that I think, it, it, for our purposes, is more important, which is 
you have a site online, that site's going to talk to the API to get inf information that users want. But an API, if you open it up to, to the world, any site that wants information about what your library knows about, books and the other sorts of holdings, what the events are, anything that your library knows about, that site can get just by talking to the API. It doesn't have to know anything at all about how you are managing your data, which is a whole you know, mess of, of complex programming. Just talks to the API. And so now, if a site wants to talk about, I'll say books, wants to talk about books, refer to a book, have a stream of here's what our, our users are reading, here's what they're, it knows how to do it. It just has to talk to the API, and the, the API will feed all that information in. It makes what the library knows about available to any developer in the world who wants to use it. That is essential to preserving what libraries know about, what, preserving library culture, which is to say our culture. Likewise, if somebody wants to build an application that uses some type of library-based information, something libraries know about, they can do it without asking permission. But you don't even know they're doing it for any of these applications. If you open it up, people can generally do this permission-free and without letting you know. They're just using it, which is amazing. It's how the web was built, by providing permission-free services. And there's a, likewise, if new devices come along, uh, if somebody comes up with a new type of e-reader or there's a new type of phone or whatever, it allows them to connect to library resources without libraries having to do any additional work, which makes it much more likely that these devices are going to uh, make library information, library culture available. And this, these APIs are used all over the place. The Library of Congress in the United States has one. Europeana has a fantastic API. Um, uh, this is the Digital Public Library, Library of America has one uh, that provides enormous amounts of information. Harvard Library, which is, uh, this is actually a project, this is my project out of the Library Innovation Lab that I used to co-direct there. It has open API to, a term, to 13 million, information about 13 million holdings and usage information as well. It's pretty awesome, about, in my opinion, anyway. Um, and so uh, your National Library has one as well. This is amazing. It's awesome. It's a huge change in advance for getting li maintaining library culture. So, so does the German National Library. Um, so this, this is the, the rise of APIs, and it's not obviously not just for libraries. It's uh, in many places, including Facebook, for goodness sake. This is a change in how we think about the future. The idea that, oh yeah, it's a good idea. Let's make available to anyone some set of our resources, our services, our data, so that they can build things that we did not anticipate, we could not anticipate. And if we could anticipate, we don't have the resources to build every little thing that everybody wants. So let's open it up. Rather than trying to anticipate and prepare for what people want, I think is an important change in how we, that is, our cultures, think about the future. OK, so this is part two of more meaning. I, this is going to be about linked data. Um, we'll see how this goes. I, I, I know that many of you are familiar with it, and you can tell me this is such, anyway, you'll tell me where I'm getting this wrong in a minute. So um, a few years ago, when, when I was at the Library Innovation Lab, and we were building the, the, the API, um, we wanted to, the, the plan was to try to be an API not just for Harvard Library, but for any other library that cared to make its, its data available. And of course, they choose which data, but uh, to make some of their data available. And um, there's a, a great, a wonderful group in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called the Tibetan Buddhist Resource, Resource Center that came to us and said, oh, we have, I forget how many, six million, we have records of six million mainly historic documents, and we'd love to make it available through, that stuff av available through your API, the metadata about that stuff. And so we had a, a very familiar sort of meeting in which the two technologists from both sides said, uh, well, yeah, do, we, we care about titles. Our system makes, titles are a thing in our system. Do your documents have titles? Yes, they do. They have authors, et cetera. They have dates. A lot of shared metadata. It went very, very well. Um, lovely, lovely people um, on both sides, actually. Um, and then at the, the end, they said, you know, there's one piece of information that's very important within, within our tradition, uh, and we wonder whether you we suspect you do not have a field in your marked records for 
who the author is a reincarnation of. And we said, well, actually, we don't. That's an excellent point. Our culture, that the culture that built the mark, the mark records, made the, you know, the, the set of categories that we track, didn't care about reincarnation. And we figured out, it wasn't hard to figure out a way to do it, but the point is that decisions about uh, coming up ahead of time with the set of categories that we care about, whether it's, it's Dewey Decimal System or it's Mark Records or whatever, obviously very useful, but it's also very limiting. It's just limiting. You're not, you're not gonna have a slot for reincarnation. And that's one reason why Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web and made it available without any intellectual property restrictions, which is the only reason that it su succeeded. Um, about 10 years ago, he came up with something called linked data. And linked data is enormously complex. It's well over my head, but here's a quick explanation. So rather than having fields for deciding ahead of time that we care about authors, we care about titles, etc., you instead take all of the information that you have and you turn it into triplets. That is, you connect two, two points with some type of connector. So Dante is the author of the Inferno. But there are other things we know about the Inferno. We know that the um, Inferno is, is set in hell. The Inferno is a book, all sorts of different information. So you, you make as many of these triplets as you want, and they're all interconnected. And this is obviously a tiny, tiny, tiny example. Um, and now you can accommodate any sort of information that arises. And furthermore, as people do this, you can start to inter interconnect what you know. So the Garden of Earthly, Denight, uh, <laughs> Garden of Earthly Delights, um, it's not a book, it's in a museum, as you, you well know, it's, but it has some connection because it's also has a setting in hell. It also has some religious themes going on in it. And those can then be captured and merged. And so now you're hooking information up, which is enriching, enriching, it, enriching it, making it more meaningful. And you may notice some things in doing this, that, or machines may notice, machine learning uh, algorithms may notice that, oh, both of these are about the afterlife and both have three parts. I wonder if three is an interesting number. And maybe that's an unusual idea, maybe it's an old idea, it doesn't matter. These sorts of relationships can be found. So then you take this sort of linked data set up and you start merging it, connecting it with other linked data implementations. So um, if, it's, uh, if, um, if a place name is mentioned in a book, well, you can connect that to linked data sets about place names. And if that's connected to weather, you connect that. And if that's connected to, you start to link the world together. And we suddenly have systems that are now far more navigable and by humans and also by machines. This, this sort of ever-increasing agglomeration of information, very granular information that enables it to be connected, um, is what I and other people would call a library graph. Graph is a technical term. It's something you can build out of linked data or other types of data representations. Library, a library graph, if we were able to continually link together what each library knows, each reader knows, uh, each author knows, every public, whatever, to all the other systems that are beginning to build these sorts of graphs, we would have something. Library, what libraries know would become far more available to us. And ultimately, I think this is the way that we fill the hole in the internet where our library should be. With all of the, getting, the idea is to fill it with everything that libraries know. That's the goal. And libraries know, libraries know a lot. And not just about their content, because you also know about your community. You know what matters to your community. You know this because you're, 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 you're acquiring holdings based on that. But you, also, you know so much about what your community knows, and individuals in your community know this as well. If we can get this information available and accessible, then we change the world. We not, not only keep library culture alive on the internet, but this is a resource that changes how we know. So I'm gonna suggest, almost at the end, I'm gonna suggest one way of getting there, and this is where uh, Spain is ahead of the United States, one of um, many ways. Sorry, I just had, you got me thinking about Trump, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pull myself out of the Trump hole and. So one way to get there um, is this. 
So you all have what in the, the United States we call integrated library services, which are just the back end services the, the, uh, for managing your collections and uh, your users. And um, so if we can get all of these, uh, these integrated ILSs, integrated library services up into the cloud, so that you know what I mean, um, so they're not being managed locally, they will have access they, to many, the, to what many libraries know across many communities, and they can start to do wonderful things. Um, I'll give you one example. It's clearly very important, and I think everybody will agree, that it's very important that we break down the walls between communities of different sorts, because we're doomed if we don't do that. To, make, to work across all differences. So let's say you, in your community, uh, you know, either informally or by looking at the, uh, analyzing the data, you know that um, people, when people search for information about, uh, doesn't matter, Greece, you know what people are reading, roughly. I'm not saying, uh, I'm gonna try to not bring up the privacy issue, but in general, you know this is, these are the books that are being used and these other ones are not being used very much. Another community, maybe it's another university, uh, maybe it's a university or you know, another community, also knows. And if you can get that information about what its community is reading uh, when it searches for information about Greece, if you could magically somehow present to your users, you say, your user says, I, what should I read about Greece? You, you come up with the right list. Your, your system comes up with the right list. It would, I think, be very useful to be able to say, so here, here's what our community thinks is the best stuff about Greece, but you might also be interested over here, make sort of a separate list that says, you know in the next town over? They're reading something different about Greece. If you're a university and somebody's searching for evolution, here's what we're reading, but you know what they're reading over at this other university over here? The one that is our rival, perhaps, or another great university from somewhere else in the world? Here's what they're reading. Maybe that's interesting, too. And this is a straightforward and easy way to start to bridge some of these gaps, to take what other communities have learned and to use it to expand what your community uses. All of this information should be, could be available in a cloud-based integrated library service system. Now, Spain has, as I understand it, you have that, at least for public libraries, don't you? What's the name of it? I, sorry, I can't hear you. Just somebody say it uh, uh, really loud. What are you all using? Absisnet. Um, I, I, I have difficulty hearing, I'm sorry. So public libraries are, have what we would call in the US an integrated library service and it's cloud-based. So you are well ahead of us in that regard. Uh, we, uh, US pu public libraries do not have anything like that. The multiple competitive ones. Um, it's a, as I understand it, it's a commercial service. It's a, it's a business. And I, I, you know, I, I like business. I'm sorry that, it's, that this information is in the hands of a private company. I have no, I've never heard of it before, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant about it. It may be a wonderful public-minded company. Doesn't matter if it can be moved to start thinking about how to provide an open public API to the collect, individual and collective knowledge that it gathers every minute from public libraries so that we, meaning everyone in the world, can start taking advantage of that and learning from it and breaking down and crossing barriers by seeing what other communities are doing and what they value and how they, they think about things, that would be pretty great. I have no idea how close you are to doing that. I hope you are very close. And if not, then maybe there's something that can be done. Because, and now I am done. Um, for me, making, uh, treating libraries as platforms ulti ultimately means making available, that ev making available everything that libraries know. Making it available to humans who have questions, but also to machines that are able to integrate information beyond human scale the scale of an individual human. Uh, it means make, uh, the everything means, sure, what libraries know about books and the rest, uh, that's very, very important. 
but also about their communities. And there's lots of community-based information that could be shared without violating anybody's um, privacy. And I'd be happy to talk about some of those ways. That's really important stuff that libraries know about, the needs and, and values of their communities. Libraries platform means making as much of it available as openly to as many different life forms as possible. Make that, that will provide, that means giving more, more access, more knowledge, more possibilities, and ultimately more meaning, which is what we want. And so this is my closing imploring that we can together make more future because we are at that point. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, maybe some questions? Sure. Uh, si hay alguna pregunta. Hello, thank you very much, David, um, for your inspiring talk and your wonderful presentation. I really understood why Everything is Miscellaneous is my favorite book. Oh, I'm you. Eva Mendez. I'm the current chair of the European Open Science Policy Platform. And I think you, you, you put in, in, in place on the table the main issues that we are dealing now with the openness in the libraries. One hand libraries, linked data, and how to make librarians to be part of this knowledge. I want you to elaborate a bit more. What do you think is the role of the libraries in the citizen society? Uh, I mean, in the citizen science-based society. How can the public library perhaps make a kingdom for innovation with citizens, which is one of my main concerns? Thank you very much. I, I, can, make a sort of, I can make up an answer. I think you know so much more about this and have thought so much more about it than I have that I would like to ask you the question. So how would you answer that question? <laughs> I'm perfectly serious. I mean, clearly you know more than that. <laughs> it's a boomerang question, yes. Well, probably the, the main uh, point for gathering citizens and enjoy doing innovation and science, even if they are not scientists. But the, the thing is that from your experience in the, in the libraries in the US, perhaps you have more um, ideas about, for example, making a public library a maker space, but when the space is just a, an excuse to make knowledge happen. So perhaps you have some more thoughts, thank you. Well, I, I am happy, I am about to have your thought, so. <laughs> Thank you. So makerspaces are wonderful, and I understand that last, uh, the last meeting was about that. Um, but I think, I, I think what I would put what you're talking about, which doesn't, I don't need to re-put it, you were very, very clear, is that um, there's room for makerspaces for ideas as well as for objects. And makerspaces are, from my point of view, uh, somebody goes in and makes a Star Wars chess set, which is sort of one of the you know, prototypical uses of, 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 of uh, 3D printing. Um, that's fine, that's great. The kid has a Star Wars character. What, what's really important, I think, to everybody here is that this kid now has a sense of, oh, there's more possible. I can do more things in physical space than I thought I could. That's really a liberating idea, even if the person never uses a 3D printer again, but goes on to. But it's the same thing for ideas, and libraries have been doing this forever. That you convene, you convene people around books. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I say books, and I know that librarians not justifiably say, uh, it, yeah, it's not just books. But that's a, I'm going to stick with that example for the moment. Um, books are a type of social object. A social object is a technical term, so I'll say how I mean it, although it also has ordinary sense. So in the technical sense, the original sense, a social object is an object that causes people to be social, brings them together to be social. And the prototypical example of a social object is a puppy. If you walk a puppy down a street, people will come around you, number two, 
will come around you, pet the dog, and start talking with you. It, just, it causes sociality. Books and other such cultural objects, library culture is full of social objects. Using them in order to convene people to start to engage with one another in ways that can be just their own opinions, but putting, doing it in a place where they have resources where they can find out more. Somebody raises a question, they can get a good answer to it. That's one of the ways in which we have the same sort of effect that a makerspace has in building knowledge. It's inspiring and encouraging people to go off and do more. This is something that libraries already do, of course, in the real world. You also do it online. Doing it online in ways in which it, each encounter adds to the community's knowledge and engagement and provokes its curiosity helps to build a culture online. So it's one thing, so here, somebody calls into a library, or let's say online, asks through email, or if you have a ask a librarian reference desk application, ask that way, uh, and ha wants to know some, some point, and gets an answer, that's great. Doing it in a way in which the question and the answer is exposed to the public if the person gives permission, is liberating the way that a 3D printer is. Because then the next person sees somebody else had a question on the same topic. Maybe this person would like to engage in a conversation on that topic. I see that I'm not the only one who had this question. Maybe, the, I, maybe I didn't think of this question. Now I can begin to see the library's answer. Maybe I can begin to see the conversation that has gathered around the social object that is a question, that is an interesting question. So doing that sort of thing in public, trying to make it more available and reusable, that's, that's how culture builds, isn't it? I mean, it, culture obviously is not the set of paintings in the Prado or the, the books in your libraries. It's the discussions and conversations around them. That's what culture is, which is why copyright taken to its extreme is, so it kills culture, it doesn't liberate it. Sorry, I'm not gonna talk about that. Nevertheless, doing this in public in a way that people can see it and add to it and learn from it is liberating and builds culture. Uh, I, and that, that sort of thing I, thing I think is essential. And I'm so glad that you are doing what you are doing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's crucial. It's critical. Uh, can, can I tweet that your, your uh, summary of your answer, something like, libraries and maker space, a place to make social knowledge and social objects. Of course, you can tweet. I think that was the third time. You can, uh, I do not control your tweets. This is how culture is made by appropriating and re-expressing. And I would, uh, thank you for asking, but feel free. <laughs> it, it's actually a quite good summary. So. Hmm. Hi, David. Thank you for, for your talk. It was very nice hearing you. Um, I, it was very interesting to, to see how you approach the idea of opening up the number of connections, uh, multiplying the number of connections of our knowledge, current knowledge, uh, making it accessible to other uh, communities. And at the same time, I'm concerned about uh, the, um, the concept of having too much uh, Data, data, or too much knowledge accessible at the same time, and how do you navigate, how you filter all this information that is um, exponentially growing, uh, and that deals with the um, sort of the role of the individuals and the sort, of, and at the same time the role of the libraries and the librarians, uh, how they deal with the communities. So at some point you get to uh, to this one one of these platforms, and you have too much information, too much data. And, and you need some sort of uh, guidance on, of some sort of, uh, you know, uh, which is a political issue at the same time, uh, of course. But uh, I don't know if how you are concerned with these issues, uh, you know, which is probably a way of going back the sort of path you're probably opening or uh, promoting. Uh, yes, um, it's a wonderful and impossible question. Thank you. Um, so we never, we always filter all the time. It's not like sometimes we do sometimes, we always filter all the time. Attention is a filter, a really crucial one. 
Uh, and on the, there is literally no way of getting an unfiltered view of the internet. There never was. Uh, maybe if you went to an internet router and watched the packets going through, that would be an unfiltered view, but it's, you wouldn't know anything. Right? You, there is no way of seeing the internet without a filter. Um, so the question has been from the beginning, okay, how do we filter? And the answer is we have to keep inventing things. There isn't a way of doing it, and as the problem scales, then we have to come up with new ways. Amazon has been fantastic, just many. I mean, every, every, system, every app that you use on the web, you are using because it filters well. And the ones that you stop using frequently is because they, the filters started failing. If you're using, I, I, you know, I, I can't, tough to give examples because I'm not sure what you're using. Every one of them is providing a way of surfacing in the millions, possibly billions of messages, et cetera, surfacing what is of interest to you. And if it doesn't, then you're not using it anymore. Amazon um, went through a, a process that I think is illustrative, I'll be very brief, when it started allowing people to put up reviews, without filters, by the way. Uh, just anybody could post any review, positive or negative. Really wonderful breakthrough for the web and for Amazon as well. I'm sorry if I say something, if I'm saying something positive about Amazon, it's just to bear with me. Um, this, I think, was very admirable. But as more and more, so it's one thing when there are 10 reviews, it's another thing when there are 1,000 reviews and then 10,000 reviews and 50,000 reviews, then you have to change how you filter. And Amazon has been very um, innovative in this in simple ways. So originally anybody posts and then they start, um, uh, picking out the most, letting you rate reviews, and then surfacing, raising up the ones that are highly rated, uh, and then noting whether you actually bought the product as a way of trying to filter out bots and the like, et cetera. So they, and Amazon reviews are still quite useful, at least to me, I use them all the time, not just for books. They have managed the scaling problem by addressing it. I am pretty confident that the people in this room, that you are better at filtering library resources than Amazon is. Amazon has clear commercial interests. You don't. I bet you're better at it. So the, the breakdown of filters, the overwhelming of filters that occurs all the time on the web and occurs in libraries as well, is something, it, yeah, it's a problem. It's life. It's a fact of life because we filter everything, and it's an opportunity to filter in new ways. I'm going to give you a really quick example, OK? Um, and this, com this comes out of the Library Innovation Lab. Um, we had access to the 13 million items in the Harvard Library. We had access to the usage patterns of these. Not who used them, but how often these books were being, books and other things. But I'm going to leave it at books. How often these books were checked out. How often they were required for courses. This is incredibly powerful data to have. And so we created something that we called Stack Score, which is for which we gave arbitrarily, we gave points to each item uh, based on how often it was checked out, how often it was used, and some other metrics as well. And then we did a little, tiny little bit of math, and every item in the library got a score between one and 100. You could then, in our, the, the um, uh, catalog uh, application that we wrote, when you search for an item, you could ask for it to be sorted by stack score, which means that you would see at the top of the list would be the work that is most consulted by the Harvard community. There's no privacy in the pro problems here. It's an aggregated score. What, if you want, if evolution, what book is most used by the Harvard community? You could break it down by school. What's most consulted by the divinity school? Just sort of an interesting question. Is it the same as what's being consulted by the schools of biology? And the idea, so this is a good way of, I think, of gathering community knowledge, what your community thinks is important, and making it available. It would, we didn't have the chance to do this, but the idea was, we'll do this for Harvard, and if another university, if MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or whoever wants to do it for their library, then we can do the thing that I mentioned, which is, okay, here's the books that Harvard Harvard's community is reading, and otherwise indicating is valuable, and here's what MIT is. And that would be so fascinating to see, and helpful 
across communities. Also, if you had enough libraries doing this, you could take a, a view of the world and see what, what, are, what are Spaniards reading when they're reading about evolution? What are Italians reading? What are Americans reading and what can we learn from one another? There are, so I bring up this example because it's very difficult for any one individual to provide a filter for the hundreds of millions of possible items. Um, this is something that in order to scale may have to be done by a community and then increasingly by more communities. This is an opportunity, it's, it's an issue, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to innovate. Thank you. I don't, in other words, I don't know. <laughs> That's a short answer. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for your wonderful Spanish, of uh, English. I have. Um, Hola. Mm, you need the translation. Good. Te hago la pregunta en español para para entenderla yo mejor. Me gustaría que volvieras a un malentendido que yo creo que es importante, puesto que creo que las bibliotecas piensan que como sus catálogos están en línea, sus datos ya están abiertos. El trabajo ya está hecho. Los, los de Library Data está ya en la web. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que está mal hecho? ¿Qué falta? No, tú lo tienes muy claro, pero creo que las bibliotecas piensan que ya está hecho, como porque los catálogos están en línea y se pueden buscar. ¿Qué piensas de eso? Can you say more about what the data is that is online? Bueno. Eh, Los, catal los catálogos de las bibliotecas están en línea, pero no son datos, no son linked data, no son datos enlazados, no, 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 no es web semántica. Eh, pero como están en internet, como se pueden buscar, pues da la sensación de que, de que ya se ha hecho el trabajo de poner la, inf la información de los libros en, en internet de forma correcta. Mm. So I did not hear... Any translation, it's possible, I'm still on channel six. So I think you were talking about uh, there's no uh, link data, there's not connections among the pieces, that sort of thing. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I may be having a problem with the headset. Uh, I'm not hearing English. Do I hear you now, thank you very much. Hey, uh, maybe some help. I, I know what is he, I, I know what he said, and I know what he's thinking, which is better. <laughs> you know, I, I think you want to point out if you want to to say a bit more on the difference between being available. The catalogs of the libraries they are there, they are available. You can click on, but they are not freely and openly available. They are not linked data compliant. It's about the reusability of the cultural content by catalogs. That's it, Thomas. Okay, uh, so if I'm answering the, the wrong question, please let me know. Actually, Marcos, could you let this, so they can correct me as I'm getting this wrong? Thank you very much. Um, so being able to browse my local library online is a very helpful tool, and it's obviously something that has to happen and has happened. It's a convenience. It doesn't change life. It doesn't change culture. It makes libraries more usable. That's a very good thing, but it, it doesn't, doesn't change the culture. What changes the culture, a few things change the culture, I, and I can't tell you all of them, I don't know. But one of them would be, and this is not what you were talking about, but one of them would be if, to make more, to get copyright, I'm sorry, I cannot avoid it, to get copyright correct for an online world where the ex expectations, like it or not, the expectations have been set that if it's not, freely, openly available online, we will not use it. So even putting the content up, and I understand that your ebook system is a separate system from the uh, integrated library system whose name I cannot remember. AbsisNet. No? AbsisNet. Okay. I understand that's separate. Having ebooks available online is very important because it does make books easier to access. But it, there's still there's still a barrier. Fixing copyright, not taking it back to an imaginary world of 200 years ago, but advancing it into a world where where, where culture will die if it's not freely and openly available. 
after some fixed term of copyright, but not forever, because culture only exists because a culture takes it up. It is not owned by authors. If authors want to own their books forever, they should have them printed out and go bury themselves in the ground. And then they'll own their books forever. And nobody will read them. They will have no effect. And we will all lose. And that's how copyright basically works now. And it's a travesty and it's a tragedy for culture. And I say this as somebody who presents copyrighted works. I'm a bit of a hypocrite. That doesn't matter. My personal failings don't, don't matter here. I also do a lot of open access publishing and edit in open access. I don't, I'm not going to defend myself. I'm a hypocrite. So getting that right, which is not your question, is crucial to culture surviving. And right now, we are continuously, on, um, from my point of view, a track for making it worse. Putting information that is designed to enable a reader to find a book and decide, perhaps, whether she wants to read it an online catalog, of course, of course, of course, we all agree, but there is no, there's very little additive value. It helps the user find a book, good. Um, it doesn't advance the culture's understand, m making anything of those books. We make things, uh, culture, of course, means how people appropriate, make their own the work of someone else, and then re-express it and learn from others. It's in that connection, the, the making of my own and sharing that with others. Catalogs don't do that. Many, many sites on the web, very popular sites, do that very, very well. We can do this by enabling social, the socializing of this information. Online catalogs generally do not do. And by doing it, I'm going to say algorithmically, that is providing the information in ways that our machines now can help us, help us humans find and understand the connections among pieces that are too far spread and too numerous for the human brain to manage. That's, linked data is exceptionally good at that. It's not the only way of doing it, but it's, it's a very good, it, technically difficult way of doing it. Um, but the outcome is so, from my point of view, so positive that I, would, I want to see that information move in that direction. And if it's not clear, personally, I really want, personally, as a citizen, want libraries to be advocates for sensible copyright and much more open access, for developing a culture of open access. And if that didn't answer, I'm sorry if that didn't address your question. Did it not address your question? It's <laughs> Ahora, usted, eh, buenos días. Usted nos ha lanzado un reto a los pobres bibliotecarios demasiado grande eh, sobre lo que podemos hacer para poner en la red todo el conocimiento que tenemos. O sea, los bibliotecarios sabemos, como bibliotecarios y como lectores, que hay, que hay no sé, un 50 o un 60 por ciento de información relevante que no está en la red. En la red está Wikipedia, están de muchas cosas, pero no está lo que lees, lo que tú conectas cerebralmente con otros conocimientos que tienes y tal. Entonces, como nosotros no podemos llevar, sacar esa información a la red de contenidos, lo, lo máximo que podemos hacer es poner etiquetas a los libros etiquetas que enriquezcan la forma de recuperar esa información. Entonces, quería preguntarle en Estados Unidos qué tipo de quién, ah, no sé cómo explicarlo, el, est el, el Estado o las universidades están investigando para hacer este tipo de, de programas, eh, API, o quién está generando ese, esa conciencia de que hay que sacar la información de las bibliotecas a la red, porque en España este tipo de proyectos los tiene que llevar a cabo la administración pública. Entonces, en Estados Unidos, no sé si es solamente un programa universitario de IMASD o quién está haciendo estas investigaciones para sacar la información de las bibliotecas al, al resto del mundo. Gracias. Thank you. 
and by the way, it's, it's a wonderful translation. Um, thank you. Um, there, in the past, well, in the past ten years or so, there's been an explosion of interest in library technology intersecting the web and also intersecting machine learning. Um, it's a really good question, and the answer is going to be basically everyone or anyone who wants to. Um, so there are university uh, libraries in many ways have taken much of the technical lead in this because they have, in many cases, the facilities to do so. Uh, and I think it's a very good thing, an important thing for university libraries to do. Also some, especially large, because in the US and I imagine here as well, libraries never have enough money. The libraries are not rich institutions. And if they are in Spain, then you have, that's wonderful. Not in the US. And so it's mainly some of the larger libraries, the New York Public Library, San Francisco Public Library, Chicago Public Library, and others I'm not mentioning, um, have funded uh, research and development in library technology. Um, and, and not, <laughs> some of it for back end, but some of it also for open uh, library, the sorts of things I've been talking about. Much of it experimental, some of it quite real. Um, there are individuals who have been heroic in their ability, ability to innovate. There are companies that have created either nonprofit or profit-based uh, ways of trying to aggregate, con to connect readers one to another. Goodreads is one in the US. Library Thing is another. Goodreads was bought by Amazon. Library Thing maintains its independence. Uh, the aim is exactly to enable readers not only to find books, but also to discuss with books. This maybe should be an extra, an added principle to Raghunathan. Uh, that to every book a reader, but also to every book a conversation. Um, Sites like Library Thing, as well as experiments, and, and not just experiments, but um, uh, applications created by libraries and by, by university libraries and public libraries are, are doing this. There's also in the US some public uh, government support. There's an agency that provides uh, grants. The um, Library of Congress has done some very innovative things. The archives, US archives have as well. So there's a, a lot going on. Um, which is wonderful, it's what you want. Which will work, which will stick, um, is completely, is unpredictable. There's much that libraries can do, though, beyond simply providing tagging. Tagging is a relatively simple thing, a straightforward thing, I think it's a very useful thing, but there's, and you will tell me about what you're doing, but there's the obvious things of engaging readers, uh, users, the community, in the civic space that is the unique civic, civic space that is the library and enabling to, them to connect in all the different ways from play to making things to having a book club, bringing in speaker, all the sorts of things that libraries have, have always done are essential. But you can do, you can expand many of those things online as well. There is, it's as open as the internet to decide what to do. Every time there's a conversation among two or more people about something that matters to a library and that conversation is over when it's over and is lost is a loss. And most conversations we're gonna have that sort of loss, that's fine. Every time one is preserved and made public, we've added now to what the world knows about what libraries care about. There are lots of ways to do that. None of them easy, unfortunately. <laughs> Una pregunta más. Thank you, Mr. Weinberger. Um, I'm a researcher, so I'm a user. Let's say I'm a library natural user. User, consumer, prosumer, whatever you want to call it, but, but I'm a user. I'm a researcher. I've been a researcher for roughly 30 years. So I started researching at the Free Card Reference Library in the late 80s, early 90s. And of course, I, I know that you will convey with me that things have changed drastically and very fast over the last, say, 10 years or something. Not more than that. But research has become uh, a lot more complicated in the last years. Uh, at least that's my impression. I don't know if you agree with it. 
but has become a lot more complicated because, as you said, as most of the people he here have said also, um, we tend to try to find everything online, and not everything is online, and not everything is as reliable as we would like them to be. So um, we are usually quoted in the wrong way, so this is something we have to live with, that sometimes my publications are uh, referenced in the wrong way, which is kind of very easy to find. So I really don't know exactly where we are heading to. I, I would like to have your opinion about where is research, both online and on libraries, uh, heading to? I mean, what do you think the near future will be like in research terms? I, I don't know. Uh, I, it's a wonderful question. It's exactly the right question. But any question about the future, the only, the only uh, sensible answer is, especially for a complex question, is, is that we don't know. We can have some influence. We can help to make the future. Um, but there's no guarantees. I will say, oh my god, a, a, a squirrel would be doing better at this than I am. I take for my assumption, which therefore will be wrong, but my assumption is the issues that you point to are not temporary ones. They are permanent ones. That is, um, first of all, online will be our first resource. In every case, just about where we have a question, we will go online. Second of all, in, because of the abundance online, in many instances, I'm gonna say in most instances, if we don't find it online, we'll find something else. We won't, our research won't come to a stop, and we won't get on a bus and go to the library. Because if we do, especially for the more obscure things that are late getting online, the library won't have them. I, I say this about the Harvard Library, which is one of the world's great libraries, and I have tr the tremendous privilege to be able to, to use. There's still, I, I come across articles, it, it's not subscribing to those journals, because it's impossible to have an infant, nobody does. This is a um, perpetual problem. It's made worse by the fact that access is so unequal. So because I'm connected, affiliated with Harvard, I have access to one of the world's best libraries. I'm a tiny, tiny percentage of the world. I'm a privileged, overeducated white guy who has access to, has more access than almost anybody else in the world does simply because I'm affiliated with, with a, a, a big, rich um, university. That's, that's horrible. That is horrible. We can't let that, that, that is unacceptable. Why would we, is that okay? That I get access to, to more of the world's knowledge than I don't know what percentage of the world, but it's, you know, to, than the rest of the world does because I have a Harvard affiliation. It, it, it is as, unfair, maybe not, certainly not as immediately damaging to one's health as the difference in, in economic status. But in terms of knowledge, it's devastating. And so I assume that um, more and more things will be put online. I think that, I hope there's a generational change coming in which the first place to publish is online, because it, op openly online, open access, because if you don't, People will not find your stuff, or they'll find it. See, they can't read it, they can't get to it, and they'll go to something else. In a world of abund abundance, there's almost always something else. I hope there's a generational change coming, because the way it works now is horribly unfair. It should not, and is so limiting. It's not just unfair. It keeps the species much stupider than we need to be, because only a tiny percentage of the, of the population has access to, all the, to most of the information. So I don't know, maybe this is what we're doomed to. Maybe the author's cartel and the publisher's cartel will continue to have a stranglehold on information. Perfectly possible that's what's going to happen. And that's, what, that's the way the law is going in, in, in Europe and in the US. Maybe we're doomed. Um, I prefer, I hope, I don't know what will happen. I hope that we will not continue to doom ourselves. Now I'm depressed. Okay, David, thank you very much. Did I go too far with that? Uh, no, no, <laughs> it's fine, thank you very much. You. We have to continue with uh, two presentations, two experiences. Uh, bueno, vamos a continuar con 
dos experiencias en bibliotecas eh, aquí en España. Eh, la primera que vamos a ver es eh, la experiencia de la biblioteca Luis Rosales y Maite Morata va a ser quien la presente.